Spirit shine. 
time we're just going to do our giving back to God so if you have one of the bottles now's your chance take it along the aisles and uh, I'll, I'll move out of the way of these guys eh? and I'll just um, pray for that while they're doing that God we really want to thank you that you are our provider father that you um, really love us God that you really care for us father and so we pray that you would give us wisdom as we um, use this money and as we give it to you this morning thank you God all right now, after the service, we have Cafe Zana. It's a chilly morning, so if you want a warm drink to warm up your hands, warm up, then please join us through the double doors at the back. Cafe Zana would be delighted to have you, our chance to get to know you and for you to get to know us. Um, also, two weeks' time at the 5.30 p.m. service, we have another Connect service. This topic is relationships in for the long haul. This is a cool topic for building into those significant relationships in your life. It would be awesome to have you there. Now, a heads up for the males. Are there any males in the house this morning? Yep, I can see you. That's awesome. All right. Promise Keepers, it's coming up. 10th to the 11th of September, but it's not too early to register. So if you're interested, please see Hickson, Alan, Ben, or any of the other uh, men's ministry team. Also, if you want to be a part of uh, making these services happen, we have prayer meetings 20 minutes before each service in the foyer here through the double door. So that means tonight it's at 10 past 5, and it would be really cool if we saw all your lovely faces there. So tonight is our celebration service, 5.30 p.m. Um, it's an awesome chance to hear a good message, um, have a lot of worship. And right now we have a drama. So uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey, mate, how's it going? I'm glad it's small call, man. Not that good, eh? Yep. I'll tell you a joke to cheer you up, eh? Yeah. So there's these two goldfish that are sitting in a tank. One of them turns to the other and says, Hey, mate, I've forgotten how to drive. That one turns back to the other one and says, Who are you again? <laughs> no, that was dumb. I'll tell you another one. Okay, so there's these two muffins in an oven. One of them's like, Man, it's so hot in here. The other one's like, Oh my gosh, a talking muffin! <laughs> I, I think I like the first one better. So, um, have you thought about it? No, nah, mate, I, I don't bake. No, not that. The, the other thing, the thing we talked about. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And? I'm not convinced. Okay, well, what more do you need to know? <sighs> I'm just not sure. Okay, well, what are you unsure about? I mean, I've answered all your questions. You've spoken with the pastor. What more do you need? Well, do you remember when you told me to let you know if you're being too pushy? Yeah. I'm letting you know. Oh, okay. Sorry, I mean, I, 
I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. Seriously, though, I mean, what's the issue? What you're asking is a big step, and I'm not sure if I'm ready. Okay, well, well, you, you, you don't actually have to be ready. I mean, that's why it's called taking a step of faith. Yeah. I, it's still scary taking risks. S scary taking risks. Look where you are, man. You're 20 stories up on a six-inch beam. You take risks every day. Yeah, but that, that's different. I don't even think about beams anymore. Yeah, but I bet the first day you got here you thought about it, and you just did it, right? Yeah, but, but I knew it was going to be okay. But you still had to, you know, believe that you're going to be all right. You know, you had to have faith that, that, you, that everything was going to be okay, right? Yeah, but I'm not used to taking the types of risks you're talking about. You know what? This reminds me of something that you said back when we were at school, when you were trying out for the school play. Yeah, and? And the way I remember it was... I can't do this. It's too late for that now, don't you think? Well, what if I make a fool of myself? Dude, you're in a school play wearing bokeh knickers. You're already making a fool of yourself. You're just going to do it in front of more people. Thanks for the confidence boost. That's why I'm here. Now let's go. Now let's n s n stop making people wait. Fine. Now that was different. You keep saying that. What? Oh, that was different. Yeah, so? So you can't keep using that as an excuse. All the situations I've talked about have been different in some way, but they've all involved taking a risk of some kind, you know, of stepping out into the unknown. One of these days, you've got you to have to stop using your excuses and, and start living your life. Anyway, I'm on the other side of the site. I've got to go, okay? But I'll talk to you later on, all right? Good riddance, man. Trust Mike to throw the school play back in my face like that. I, I know he means well. He, he just doesn't understand. I mean, a a six-inch metal beam is something real. Just like the school play, I could hear and see the audience. But this, asking me about God, is different. Asking me to step out and rely on God, something, someone I can't even see. I don't even know if I'm ready. Or if, or if I'm even good enough.
to come into. There's a whole bunch of uh, ladies who are here this morning who have been at uh, camp together and uh, we here had a great time and, and uh, I hear some of the guys survived. I'm not sure if all of them did. But let's give everybody a hand for the weekend. I mean, <laughs> This morning... Uh, we were going to have a baptism. Um, there's a number of people that haven't come to that place yet, and uh, haven't had baptism yet, and going to have baptism, but nobody's forthcoming for this weekend unless I don't know about it. Uh, it's going to be a dry one if we tried this morning, it's empty. But we could have one tonight if, as an outcome of what we talk about this morning. It's, it's helpful. See, most of us... Um, in this world, we, we live with certain inhibitions. We live with certain things that restrict us, and stop us, that sometimes depower us. Sometimes we feel uh, totally disempowered. We, we don't feel we can do the things that perhaps we'd even love to do, or, or perhaps we are in such a state we've never dreamed of doing great things because we've never believed that it was possible with each one of us. This morning, we're kind of talking about that because we're talking about the whole subject, the freedom of faith. You probably notice the cross up there is changing in shape. And the reason I've used that little clip is it stopped. It moved and then stopped. Never mind. The reason I, I chose that little clip is because for a lot of us, the perspective we have on Life and faith is actually um, affected by the way that we've been raised, by the things that are around us. We don't like to think that's the case. I come from a background where uh, we were sent to Sunday school because it would be good moral input for us. I joined the choir to get out of Sunday school because I didn't see much benefit in what was happening for me, especially in the Sunday schools we went to, they weren't. Particularly Libya, the only, only one I really did enjoy was when we lived in Cheviot. And um, as a little town, sort of halfway between Kaikoura and Christchurch. And, and uh, there was a Sunday school teacher there who was absolutely wonderful. And somehow her face still stands out to me to this day. And I, don't, I can't even explain why. Just something about her. But because of the worldview in my family, I had incredible trouble any sense of faith, any sense of belief whatsoever. Believing in God, well, 
I wasn't sure I didn't believe in God. But um, I was absolutely certain I, I couldn't get my head around some of the scientific worldviews. I love science, and I just, I just couldn't get my head around some of the ideas that were floating around at that time. So I want to talk about a freedom of faith, something which means that your stuff in your past, the stuff that's around you doesn't hang you up or stop you. And I want to say this to you. If you think I'm a Christian and this doesn't apply to me, it's going to equally apply to you as much as anybody. So there's nobody here as an individual target. I don't like that kind of thinking. Uh, I want to see every one of us come into this freedom. Because the reality is that faith is scary because it seems intangible. When, when somebody is not well, one of the last things that you often find many Christians will do is ask for prayer for healing. Why is it that that's a reaction? Because in the New Testament, the automatic reaction was to ask for prayer, to ask God to do something, and people were being healed left, right, and center. And the reason it, it's like that is because two sides of it. One is faith really is intangible in some way. Sometimes we're scared of failure. Some of us, if we're really honest, we're scared somebody's going to pray for us and then end up saying, well, you haven't been healed. It must be your fault. Now, that kind of thinking that floats around our society. But faith in Jesus can even be intangible sometimes. You know, the question's there. The, the real issue is facing you. You know, the scripture says, uh, blessed are those who um, see and believe, but even more blessed are those who haven't seen and yet still believe. Why is that? Why, why, does, why does the scripture say that? Well, it says it because it's just that bit harder. The disciples walked around with Jesus. They saw what he did. They heard what he said. They touched, felt, ate, slept, all in the same places together for three years. And uh, even they sometimes came to places of doubt rather than faith. So the, so the reality is, it kind of is intangible, especially for those of us later in his history. So I want to ask the question, how can I hope to ex experience faith if I don't believe yet? See, that's the crazy thing about faith. It really is a crazy thing. Because the truth of the matter is, you actually do believe. Did you know that? You just don't realize you believe. It's, what, it's just a matter of what you believe in. That's actually the key that sits here. It turns the questions upside down in a real sense. Paul says these words in the Bible. He says, uh, we live by faith, not by sight. That's true. Doesn't matter who we are, we live like that. Now, Paul was applying a certain application, but, but in the general sense, this is true. We actually do. You think, you think for, seriously about it. We actually believe the impossible, right? Many of you have seen bumblebees flying around. Isn't that true? Scientists have said it's a mystery to them how, to them how they can fly because every rule in aerodynamics, etc., is broken by the bumblebee, but he still flies. He still buzzes around. I imagine it's a bit harder for him to fly than the ordinary bee. But he flies. And we look at him and we say, well, he flies. How does he fly? Well, scientifically, it's pretty hard to explain how he flies. It's a difficult one. Now, we know there must be reasons why he can fly so well, because he does fly. And so we believe that, don't we? Is that true? You don't look at bumblebees and think, that can't fly and it drops to the ground. Doesn't happen. Second thing. Planes fly, and we get in them. Now, if you knew as much about uh, engineering side of planes as I know, you probably wouldn't get in them so easily. I was in a storm once, and it's such a violent storm that we couldn't hear the jet engines. The only thing we could hear was the, the cabin going bang, bang, bang in the center cabin. All the body of the plane was distorting crazily. And we're all sitting there, the plane, I was on a business flight, all the business people used to flying regular as 
They weren't even talking. It was quiet as. Nobody was talking in that plane. And uh, everybody was thinking one thing. We might not make it. I actually wasn't thinking that. I was thinking far worse things. I could see in my mind the plane going like this and the wings going like this. And I know I've looked out the window many times. And if you look real hard, you see all these rivets holding these little bits of aluminium to the, to the wing. All I could see in my mind's eye was the rivets going. And bits of metal flying off and then we crashed. We didn't just crash. It's a detail to me. But we didn't. We landed. We didn't even get diverted to Palmerston North like it happened before. The next morning I read in the paper, the plane that we'd been on had actually attempted a landing and as it came into the runway, some steps blew across the runway in front of us. And the plane had aborted take or, a landing, took off, did a few more circles until they got the steps off the runway and then they landed us. We had no idea that had happened. But I can tell you, we believed, we believed when we finally realized the plane had touched down. It was so violent that when the plane actually landed, we never actually felt the big boom, because everything was going boom all the time. You know? When we finally realized we'd stopped, the plane was sitting on the tarmac, and I don't know whether you've ever had this experience, the plane was still doing this, because the wind was so violent. And, uh, and all these business people that had gone into the crash position when the pilot said we were going to be landing, they were there for a long time. They all realized we'd landed, and suddenly the whole plane, these are business people who don't do these sort of things very often. You know what they did? They did this. <laughs> and clap, clap, clap. The whole plane. Because they all realized that they suddenly believed they had landed. I don't think they believed they were going to because their body suddenly let rip with all this vibrancy. You see, we believe, even, we, even though we don't think we do. The pilot came to the door, which they don't normally do for those who haven't flown much. He came to the door and watched us all go out, and you should have heard the rude things people were saying to him on their way out. I won't repeat them. But it was fun. It was a laugh. Planes fly, we get in them, we believe. Then, car seats don't collapse. We trust them. Every time we get in the car, we just sit down. I used to tease my mother-in-law when she put on a little bit, bit of weight, and she took it off a wee bit later, but she's putting on weight. She, every time she climbed in my car seat, she used to thump herself in. And I said, why, the way you jump into my car seat, the seat's going to break one day. <laughs> Was I a foolish man saying that? Did you know what happened? She sat in my car seat in my little, uh, my little car, little white car. I can't even think what it was called now. And it, the whole seat collapsed. No kidding. The back broke and the bottom broke and the whole thing collapsed. You should have seen the look on her face. Now the question is, did I create the circumstance by my belief? You would like to say I did because you think I'm a mean, nasty person to my mother-in-law. I wasn't trying to be mean and nasty. We, we used to joke about this. She used to always tell her husband, I lost four pounds this week. And he said, what, four pounds of butter? He used to say that. Because we don't believe some things. But we do believe, whether we like it or not. Houses stand and we live in them. But not everything is as it seems. Um, guys, can you play it straight from the video file it's done in? Had my AVI files play out this week and last night, in fact. Scenes in Turkey feared back in the UK. Four people have died following heavy rains that have triggered floods and landslides in the north of the country. In Trabzon, dramatic amateur footage showed a house collapsing under the weight of a landslide. An eyewitness said he called the owner of the building to warn of the danger. Five minutes after his family fled, their home collapsed. <laughs> 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 
Rescuers are fighting to find others. Scenes in. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you know, did you notice the unbelief in the man who built his house? Oh, I don't believe it's happening to me. You see, the reality, it was happening. But you see, he had believed in his house for so long, it would never fall down. And he got it wrong. And that's the problem that we actually face, is that we actually believe things that are actually not true, and we don't believe things that are. See, he never believed his house would fall down. Beautiful big house. And you could see his distress on the roadside. When I found that video, I went looking for houses that crashed, and I thought that was such a great one. Because I think some of us are going to come to the end of this life, and we're going to be suddenly standing elsewhere other than here on earth, and we're going to, oh, no, hell didn't exist. I'm sure it didn't. You see, what we think we believe and what is reality are sometimes very different. So, not everything is as it seems. The, the other issue we have is that sometimes we trust too easily in the wrong things. Here's Botox. She wanted a better look. Well, I don't know whether it looks better, but she doesn't look good. <laughs> no? And we do that so often. How many of us have seen an advert on TV, gone and bought the thing, and it didn't quite fulfill our expectations? See, we believed in the ad, but it didn't really do it. And so that's another problem we have. We, th we sometimes feel safer with things we think we understand. And the classic thing is that house, of course. But there are lots of things we think we understand. We actually feel safer because we have a group of friends who are just like us sometimes. And sometimes that group of friends are not the most helpful people for us. Because all they're out to do is party for the rest of their life. Or all they're out to do is be selfish for the rest of their life. Or all they're out to do, well, there's all sorts of aspirations and things that people do. We need to be really careful that we don't end up sinking when we could actually be walking on the water. Later on, I'm going to play a song that spells that out. See, the, the re reality is that we buy into secular worldviews, propositions, thoughts, ideas, concepts. So there's a popular one that's around in New Zealand society that basically says, well, uh, let's live it up. No, God doesn't exist, etc. So lots of people don't say what they really think. And yet, when they were surveyed, something interesting happened. Recent research found this. Evolution is not believed by most people in New Zealand in spite of education system, TV, and let's face it, scientific propaganda. Some of the latest movies that have come out of the scientific community, and that's where they've come from, telling you all these stories about how these ancient animals lived and how they attacked each other and all the rest of it. We have absolutely no evidence to, to actually prove those thoughts. But it's being presented as science. Now, people believe that stuff. And yet, and yet 87% of people in New Zealand still say that they believe in God, according to the survey. That's crazy. There's a contradiction there. So what do we really believe? What is it there? Then there's the other side of the whole issue of faith. It's that fear robs us of the opportunity to experience real faith. There's people here that have claimed to be Christians for years in this room who really don't know what real faith is. They know what intellectual faith is. I believe in God. But their practice of faith, the experience of faith, the power of faith, the knowledge of loving God and knowing God's love and comfort and peace and power around them every day just isn't a reality. Now you ask me, how do I know? Well, I've been a pastor for 31 years, and I'd be pretty thick if I didn't know. It's the bottom line. I can see it when people find it necessary to be nasty to others. I can see it when people find it it's okay to not spend time with God every day, but to say I'm a Christian. I can see it when I see 
people who live lives that don't have the charitable nature and aspects that God talks about, about being a follower of God. You see, the truth of the matter is, that is actually faith. And we can either have a negative faith or a positive faith, and, and faith in God means that we trust Him, that we believe Him, we talk with Him, we share with Him, because faith is not about anything else other than much more than what we have limited it to sometimes. The relationship aspect is absolutely imperative to faith. So the truth of the matter is, we can ask the questions, well, what if I'm, I'm overtaken? What if I become a follower of Jesus, but, but things don't work out the way I think they should? What if I'm no longer me? I don't know whether I can live with the faith which is not me. Can I tell you something really quietly and gently? There's probably a whole lot of friends that would love you to be different. And family. In the way that God intended. That's the reality. They don't mean to say you're horrible, bad people or nasty people or, or any of those sorts of things. I mean, but if you really live in the faith, you will be changed. So you don't have to ask the question, what if? It's not a what if. You will be. doesn't matter because it's better at the end of the day. What if I never make it? What if I suddenly decide I want to be a follower of God, but, but all the other things I really love, I don't want to let go. He might ask me to let go. My boyfriend or my girlfriend or whatever it happens to be, whatever's important. My aspiration is to be wealthy. Maybe God wants me to live in poverty like Francis of Assisi, who gave up all the wealth of his family. And when his father demanded he give everything back that belonged to him that he had ever purchased for his son, Francis took off all his clothes and walked away naked. Now that was a bit extreme and I wouldn't recommend you do that. But it certainly spells out a point. That actually really, according to Francis, he says it wasn't worth having. It wasn't worth having. What if no one's there, the question? What if God really isn't there? Well, let me suggest something. When you jump in a car... You put the key in the ignition and turn it. What do you expect? An electric shock? No. You expect... Vroom, 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 vroom. I always remember some years ago, I used to love watching uh, the TV program. I can't remember what the name of it is. They used to set things up to trick people and video them. Can of camera, that's the one. Can of camera. The one I really enjoyed, and I still remember it to this day, they got this Mercedes, they gave to this person, they told them they could have the Mercedes. The keys are in the car and everything. And, um, and uh, so in any case, the guy jumps in the car, turns the key on, nothing can happen. And he gets out of the car and he, he says to the guy, it's not going. The guy said, yes, this. He says, the engine's very, very quiet. And you're in the car, you can't hear it. So, okay, the guy said, I'll prove it to you. So he jumps in the car. Um, and the guy jumps in with him and turns the key on. And he says, you hear that? I said, no. And the guy pulls out of the car park and he drives off down the road. And he parks at the bottom and gets out, your car, mate. Wow, says the guy. And he jumps in the car. Nothing happened. And what they'd done, they'd, there's this garage on a very steep incline on the side of a hill. And they hadn't, they'd taken the engine out literally. And he'd gone down the hill, and he got to the point where he believed it, but he believed in the wrong thing. These candid camera guys are naughty, but it was funny. I thought it was the most amusing thing. Some of you probably wouldn't have enjoyed it as much as me, because I'm mechanical by background, and so those kind of things amuse me highly. If you jumped in your car and you went to drive away, and I lifted the bonnet, found the engine gone, you'd probably find me laughing. You might not be, but I would. It's the way it is. And then the last thing is if I want to have faith, God, will you hear my prayer? Will you answer me? I'm too scared to ask, just in case you don't. In fact, some people think if I start talking to God, he's going to go, oh, I never noticed him. <laughs> Burnt. You know? It's the impression some people have. Well, he's not like that. Because you see, the fact of the matter is 
The scripture in Hebrews says these words, and in the book of Hebrews talks about faith in all sorts of different dynamics. Talks about people who, who had incredible faith. People who had faith in spite of the lifestyle they had, like the prostitute. Um, like the, the people who, who were great people of faith. All the different ones who experienced faith. And he said these words, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So if you're looking for the normal experiences of faith that we often have, you're actually not going to find them if you think in the framework that you do. See, most of us don't realize that we live by faith every time we walk into the door of a house, climb in our car, jump in an airplane or whatever. We don't think of it as faith. But it is. The other night, I don't know whether any of you saw it, but the plane where the back end of the plane fell off as it was flying through the sky and crashed. I think it was last Sunday night, 9.30. Seconds from disaster. And why had it happened? Because some guys, when a guy had taken off in an airplane 22 years earlier, had hit the back of the plane as he took off, it hit the runway. And they'd done a repair on it, but instead of following Boeing's instructions, They'd put a little plate over it and glued it, and the plate was too small. It wasn't properly done. And so after 22 years, it couldn't handle it anymore. So mid-flight, the tail fell off. Now, uh, anybody going flying tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, we are. Paul and I are. I'll have to pray for you before we go. But you see that sometimes... Sometimes we've got to have real faith that's not going to be concerned about any of those kind of things. You know, if I die tomorrow in the airplane, it really doesn't matter. Oh, it matter to my children. Uh, but in terms of eternity, well, if, if I die tomorrow in a plane crash, it's likely she will too because we're in the same plane. You know, the, the truth of the matter is faith isn't about what we're certain about in one sense. But it is in the sense of believing that what we cannot see sometimes, God can do. Because we can see the evidence. You see, you can see the evidence of God working in faith in other people. If you really look at people who have real faith, not just people who say, I believe, but people you know have real faith, look at the things you can see. And you can see faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. If we're not sure, we need to deal with it. So, at the end of the day, if we start to really believe, we need to ask the question, is it that risky for us? Well, I want to ask you this question in terms of that. Why would you not want to follow, love, and relate to a loving God? Why would you not want to take the risk on that? Because some of us take huge risks in befriending people who are totally destructive to our lives. And we have faith in them, and it's misplaced, and yet God is totally, totally there for us in a real sense. So what are the things that each of us needs to look at to experience real faith? For every one of us, it's going to be different. Different. For some of us, we're going to need to put aside some of our presuppositions, some of our worldviews that we've learned at school or on television or from family or whatever. When I became a Christian, it was very traumatic. I'm not going to say that faith is easy. I know Christians who preach that. It's not that easy sometimes. It's tough. It's hard. But I can tell you, it's real. Very, very real. Very tangible. So what are the things that you need to deal with? What are the things that you need to look at to experience real faith? Because of the things that we all have. The truth of the matter is, you know you've made, you're made for more. Most people do know that. There's some people who don't. But the reality is that we're made for more than we live for. Jesus made this strong statement one day. He told us that we would do greater things than he's done if we if we're truly his followers. We're made for more. Me included. So exactly what could faith mean for you? Now some people have this impression they're made for more and so they think, you know, I'm obviously made to be wealthy. I'm obviously made to have the most beautiful wife or handsome husband in the world. 
They think all these things. But that's actually, when they get it, it's not even satisfying. Not even satisfying. Because we're actually not made for that kind of more. We're made for more than we live for. God made us so we can live way beyond where we're living now. Don't care how much faith we've already got. So don't be afraid to move. Don't hold back. Don't allow people's past issues and problems and attitudes or your responses and attitudes to limit who you can be. Don't allow that ever to happen. Because in the reality... Your faith is all it takes. It doesn't take somebody else's faith. You saw the two guys in the workplace on the beams. I always remember when we were building this building, walking along the beams here. There's another guy who said to me, oh, I can't do that. And so what he did, he got over the beams, wrapped his legs around like this, and he shuffled along. You take a long time to get from there down here if you're shuffling. Faith means you've got to get up and walk. If you're going to try and shuffle, you'll never get there very easily if you ever do get there. And walking along those beams might have seemed terribly unfaith, uh, 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 unsafe. rather. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that once you get the confidence, you're okay. And that's what faith is really like. So faith in God and me? What's God allowed to do in my life? I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning to make some kind of response. And there's some of you here this morning that uh, already have some faith in Christ. You have a little bit of belief or maybe you've had a reasonable amount, but things aren't in a good space for you. I'm going to invite you I'm going to invite, actually, Tepper and the team, can we have you back up, okay? It's a bit of a surprise. It wasn't planned. Music team, if you can come up quickly. Thank you. And I'm going to... I want to invite those of you who are in that place I just described. As we sing a song that you might like to come down here so that people can pray for you. There's some of you that have never been in that place of faith yet or maybe you've been in the past and you've walked away from God. I'd like to invite you to make some kind of response and say, okay God, I'm willing to step out. I'm willing to come into that place of freedom of faith. Not to be inhibited or controlled by faith that I don't even understand because I've just been raised with the thinking I have in my life. Or I've chosen things that haven't been good sometimes. Or I've just been neutral. I'd like to invite you to make that response this morning. If for any other reason that God's spoken to you this morning that you need to come forward, and maybe you've already become a follower of Jesus, but you haven't done baptism yet, and you know that that's your next step, I want you to, to also come down. The baptism people, can they come over here? Because I'm going to get... Uh, I'm going to get Greg and Greg, if he doesn't mind, Greg and Yvonne, perhaps, um, just to pick up on those people, uh, just for a moment. And uh, but the others can all come across the front here. So the team's going to come on stage now. And they're going to come and uh, and lead us in the song that that um, Tip had early on this morning. Unless he's got another one he wants to go for. And I want you all to just stand. We're going to sing My Hope Is In You, which is, uh, which is a statement of faith. That real sense. So I'm going to get um, Tepra and, and the team here to sing just the first part of the song and, and then you can come and make responses. I don't want you to try and sing initially because some of you will sing because that's your good escape hatch. 
I'm slamming the escape hatch today. I want you to really consider, am I living in the place that God would really want me to live with real faith? Have I ever taken the risk to step out and know faith? Those are two questions for different groups of people. Let's, let's have the guys lead us in song here. Amen. Make this your heart cry. Don't sing it though. Just make your heart cry just for now. <coughs>
some people need. And the guy at the front doing it is not always quite the right thing for some people. So turn to your neighbour and say, hey, do you think you need to make some kind of response this morning? Faith, would you like me to be with you? Come down, make response. Tim's gonna lead us in that song one last time. Thank you, guys. <laughs> 